This is Kennedy Classics with Dr. D. James Kennedy. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jerry Newcomb. And I'm Jennifer Cassidy. We are just over two weeks away from the important midterm congressional elections. One of the great concerns many Americans have is the economy, jobs, runaway government spending. And at a deeper level, the question is, what should the government provide for us in America? Many people, including well-meaning Christians, are confused about that issue. As a result, they've given tacit approval to socialism. On today's program, we're going to take an in-depth look at socialism from a biblical perspective and we'll give you the opportunity to get your copy of a new bestseller about the attempts to remove God from government and public life. Because this issue is so vitally important, we're going to deviate from our normal format and bring you a special report on the dangers of socialism. Our own Dr. Jerry Newcomb brings you this report, Socialism, A Clear and Present Danger. Socialism has a kind of moral intuitive plausibility. I mean, you know, look at the socialist rhetoric. It's always very appealing morally. Karl Marx said, if you take over the means of production, you can plan the economy and everything will be great. But it really is a suppression of man and a forbidding of man to, to follow God. They have to follow the government because the government is trying to be God. You're looking at a carnage of, of incalculable amounts of human lives that were literally sacrificed to an economic system. You can have a, an economy and a society that tries to guarantee a, an equality of opportunity, but not an equality of outcome. Socialism, a clear and present danger, a biblical response. Winston Churchill once said that capitalism is the unequal distribution of wealth, socialism is the equal distribution of poverty, and communism is socialism with a gun at your back. Now there's quite a controversy about the issue of socialism and what the proper Christian response should be. There are differences among believers about this issue. Some Christians are calling for social justice that is defined in ways that promote big government such as governmental control over the economy in the name of helping the poor. Is this what the Bible teaches? We're going to explore these issues in depth in this program, but first, let's get a handle on exactly what socialism is. The ultimate enemy, oftentimes in our movies and other things we see, is the business guy. In this scene from a Star Trek movie, a future utopia is described. No money. You mean you don't get paid? The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. Such sentiments seem to appeal to our higher nature, and in an era of near financial catastrophe, such a utopia may seem desirable. The siren song of socialism usually does. But does socialism really lead down the path of peace and prosperity for all? Socialism just says everyone's the same. Well, as you look at your neighborhood, you know everyone's not the same. Socialism has kind of proved itself to be bankrupt, but it's not dying out in the intellectual world. We need to be concerned about the ways in which socialist thinking uh, is creeping into the general public and also into the churches. There is a concern that socialism and the philosophy behind it is extending its tentacles into American life. I believe in many of our government policies, unwittingly, the average American is allowing himself to be led by groups that have left leanings toward a manifestation of socialism. For example, long before he ran for president, note what Barack Obama said on a Chicago radio station in 2001. The Supreme Court never ventured into the issues of redistribution of wealth uh, and sort of more basic issues of political and uh, economic justice in the society. I'm not optimistic about bringing about uh, major redistribute uh, change uh, through the courts. You know, the institution just isn't structured that way. Critics would note that defining justice in terms of redistributing wealth is an idea imported from classic socialism. Socialism is the government running the economy. 
the government uh, guiding or uh, owning uh, resources in the economy, not uh, people in the private markets. And government socialism manifestly does not work. If it did, the Soviet Union would have won the Cold War. But the overall goal of all socialism gets back to one thing, government control of private property. For example, Karl Marx wrote, the theory of the communist may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. While socialism proclaims paradise to those who try it, in reality, it just delivers one nightmare after another. That's particularly true of the communists, who have proven to be the greatest killers of all time. Former communist Marvin Olasky. This ruthlessness is seen actually as a, as a type of, of mercy. Rather than have a long drawn out civil war, you strike quickly, kill the people in the way, take over, and then create a new human nature. You give them enormous power uh, in a revolutionary government, there's going to be enormous atrocities. Former communist David Horowitz. And people who uh, call themselves progressives and liberals, uh, those people killed 120 million people uh, since 1917 in the name of creating uh, a better world. Yet socialism is taught in our schools at virtually every level, especially in the universities. Joshua Muravchik has written a definitive book on the history of the movement, Heaven on Earth, The Rise and Fall of Socialism. If you go to universities any place in the world, including very much in the United States of America, which is not a very leftist country on the whole, uh, but you'll find uh, loads of professors, some who will call themselves Marxists, and others who will stop short of calling themselves Marxists, but will say Marx had wonderful insights that help us to interpret the world. Now we've got, you know, 21-year-old conservative evangelical Christians in Christian colleges that are thinking more or less like socialists. Now they're not secularists, but when it comes to basic economic understanding, their basic understanding of what economics is like, they think not only is it correct, they think that in fact the Christian worldview uh, implies or requires socialism. The problem is that's really making an economic system do what only the gospel of Christ can do. And no economic system can deliver on those promises. Socialism is a clear and present danger. Socialism never works, yet it keeps getting repackaged in different ways. We want to take a look at two examples, two case studies, if you will, one old and one modern day, proving once again that socialism is a dead end in more ways than one. When the pilgrims first came in 1620, they were forced to engage in a form of socialism. When the pilgrims came, they were under the um, jurisdiction of what were called the adventurers, who were the ones who funded them. Well, when they got here, then they were required by the adventurers to have everything in common. Bradford, their first leader, wrote about this. And he wrote about how they were starving because when you held things in common, then those who worked hard received the same as the lazy. So Bradford then divided up uh, to each family a portion of land, and before long he said it was amazing that the uh, women and children were even out there planting crops and becoming part of the whole scheme of things instead of just uh, sitting on the sideline watching things happen. Once they did that, then the colony began to prosper again. But what about modern America? How are such policies working out? Consider for a moment the case of Detroit, Michigan. We are not in a third world nation. This is Detroit, Michigan. Detroit's a war zone. They came and gave the houses away. Americans need to see what that city looks like because that city is an illustration of what happens when you've got big government in charge. The problems in Detroit are, are manifest, but at the root, they're all government created problems regulations, uh, labor unions, uh, you know, ha public housing. These are all problems that ultimately you can trace right back to government policies. 
In the 50s, Detroit was the number one industrial city of America. It was the gem of middle-class prosperity. Reverend LaVon Ewell of JoshuaTrail.org has been a Detroit area pastor for 42 years. Detroit used to be one of our most vibrant cities, but now it's lost half of its population. It has a skyrocketing crime rate. So the city's been devastated uh, through the uh, social programs that were employed over 30 years ago. One of the tragedies of this city is that only approximately 30% of their kids graduate. Almost 70% of their kids do not graduate from high school here in Detroit. Coleman Young was definitely a turning point in the city of Detroit. It went from the most prosperous city to one of the poorest cities, and he served the longest. And during his tenure, that's, the city was in decline. Coleman Young was influenced by Marxist philosophy, and uh, he employed it here in the city. He thought that the more the he could get the government to do for the city, uh, the better it was. Approximately 30% of the people in Detroit are on welfare, and you have an unemployment rate of approximately 50%. It breaks my heart to see what's happened in the last 42 years. There was a time when these neighborhoods were beautiful. The lawns were well maintained and uh, you had houses in every one of these vacant spots. And to think that this is what's happened to a city where the government said they were going to take care of people. This is the tragic end result. Someone might have set this house on fire to get the insurance because it wasn't their house. And so it was easy to do. Detroit has thousands and thousands of homes like this to the extent that the city has given up on rehabilitating many of these communities and now they're talking about just bulldozing much of the city. If we continue to do what Detroit did for 40 years, give people things they didn't work for, give them social programs, we can expect this to happen all over America. Now we come to the heart of the controversy. At the end of the day, the only opinion that truly matters on any issue is that of the Lord. What does the Word of God say on the subject of socialism? Obviously, the scriptures are not a textbook on economics, but can we glean from the Bible some clear teaching related to the topic of socialism? We've interviewed a wide variety of Christian leaders on the subject. In Michael Moore's recent film, Capitalism, A Love Story, we hear the official pronouncement of some Catholic clergymen decrying free market economics as being anti-Christian. It's radically evil. Capitalism is wrong and therefore has to be eliminated. One of the great clashes in the modern world is between two mutually exclusive systems, socialism and free enterprise, sometimes called capitalism. Advocates of socialism claim that it is the most effective and compassionate system for taking care of people, even that it embodies the core principles of Christianity. Cristo era comunista, más incluso que socialista. So frankly, socialism has the best branding and it appeals to quite legitimate moral intuitions that Christians have. By contrast, the free enterprise system is portrayed as cold and greed-driven, carelessly leaving disadvantaged people in its wake. But is this true? What does the Bible really say about it? I don't believe that the Bible teaches socialism. I think that that is a mental construct that folks have tried to superimpose on the Bible. The Bible teaches uh, private property. The Bible teaches that we are to um, care for our neighbor. When Richard Land was earning his doctorate at Oxford University in England back in the 1970s, he had a very interesting visit that gets to the root of this question of the Bible and economics. A young man showed up and wanted to enroll us in the Socialist Club. And I said, uh, no, I don't think so. And he said, well, I understand you're a Christian, you're a Baptist minister. And I said, well, yes, I am. He said, well, if you're a Christian, you have to be a socialist. And I said, you know, I, that's one of the more extraordinary statements I've heard. I said, it seems to me that if you're a consistent Christian, you can't be a socialist. And he looked at me like a cow looking at a new gate. And I proceeded to explain to him that socialism won't work because socialism is based upon the assumption that man is basically neutral or good. We are fallen beings and corrupt beings, and therefore you can't redeem the world uh, through human agency. But everybody on the left actually believes that it's social institutions that are the problem, not people. 
that it's capitalism that divides them, uh, private property makes them racists and exploiters, nonsense. People do that. One of the key economic principles of the Bible is that one is expected to earn one's keep. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, where some were lazing around waiting for the second coming, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. But for those who are unable to work, or who are experiencing a particularly difficult time, such as widows and orphans, the Bible certainly teaches charity. In fact, historically it was the Christian faith that unlocked the forces of charity. It was Jesus Christ who taught the parable of the Good Samaritan, and he told his followers to go and do likewise. That's not a commandment to the state. Uh, that's a commandment to us as individuals, and we should be doing that collectively through the church. It should be done by the institution closest to the people. It should not necessarily be done by government. Government only steps in as a court of last resort. But socialism is forcibly taking from one person and giving to another, and it's the government or the authorities that are doing it. And that's stealing. And the politicians that promote socialism do it as if they're the ones being kind. But really, they're spending other people's money in their kindness. At the heart of the matter is the fact that every dollar the government gives to one person is a dollar it, having no money of its own, has taken from someone else by force of law. But the Ten Commandments gives us a clear declaration from God on this topic. You shall not steal. Two of the Ten Commandments presuppose the legitimacy of private property. Do not steal. That implies that people have some property that legitimately belongs to them and that it's wrong to coercively take it from them. Do not covet your neighbor's wife or his possessions. That implies that there are certain things within the individual domain that we uh, justly have the right to. Still, despite these moral problems with government confiscation and redistribution of wealth, many advocates of socialism have pointed to the Bible for justification. One such passage is Acts 2, where the early Christians shared their property. Some have said this was a primitive form of communism. It says, now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. This is not communism. This is not socialism. This is Christianity. This is caring for one another. And, uh, and it's not the government controlling it. It is the Spirit of God within me directing me to be led of God's Spirit to help the body of Christ, and not only to help the body of Christ, but to help others. A few chapters later, in Acts 5, there's an incident where a couple, Ananias and Sapphira, sell their house and give most of the proceeds to the church. They come under the judgment of God, however, after holding back a portion for themselves. Some socialists have claimed that this judgment is a repudiation of private property but a close reading of the text shows the opposite is the case. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? You have not lied to men, but to God. They were lying though to the Spirit of God, saying that they had sold it for this amount when they really hadn't. You can do with it what you please. It's yours. Just don't lie to God. What's more, classic socialism and its offspring communism are based on a view of the universe that excludes God. These are two completely different worldviews. This is why, uh, simply on logical grounds, it's impossible to be both an Orthodox Christian and an Orthodox Marxist. You're either going to be very confused or you're going to be one or the other. In their 1848 book, A Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels told the world about their plans. One scholar summarized Marx's agenda as having two prongs, to dethrone God and to destroy capitalism. What is the real agenda of the Marxists? What is their end game? In The Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels said that the future enlightened nations will adopt many of their progressive plans, such as the abolition of private property, the abolition of inheritance through taxes, and a progressive income tax. 
A third plank of Marxism is the abolition of private property, which Marx and Engels believed would usher in a worker's paradise by eliminating selfishness and greed. And that if you can just eliminate private property, that will uh, eliminate all the things that keep people apart from each other and, and suddenly we will all uh, uh, love each other and uh, get along in perfect harmony. But history records that Marxism simply unleashed one terror after another. Kai Chen is a Chinese immigrant to America. Well, I was born in Beijing in um, 1953. That's uh, right after the communist government took over in 1949. And my parents uh, worked for the Chinese customs before the communists take over. After establishing itself, the government began exiling workers with certain backgrounds into the countryside. Kai Chen's family was among them. But after they established themselves, they started persecution. After they, they think, oh, oh now, now we can run the government now. Now we can run this agency. It, the persecution started. In the late 1950s, Chairman Mao launched his so-called Great Leap Forward. It resulted in a massive famine that killed millions. It's like communism, socialism, collectivism, these things, they want to command the nature. You see that? That very mistake caused the famine. They say, oh, I'm smarter than God, you see? I can command this land to produce that much, okay? When the land does not produce that much, they create the figures to cheat or they collect from your home to, to, to try to fill their figures. And then the result is in the countryside, there's a starvation, a huge starvation for three years. And people die, like drop like flies, and cannibalism return in the countryside. And, and uh, people eat their children, but they, they can't, some people don't, you know, they don't have the heart to eat their own children, they exchange it with their neighbors and eat their children. Uh, people die, they still, uh, you know, they still can be used. You can bury them in the land as a fertilizer. Mao said that. Though the famine killed tens of millions, Kai Chen and his family survived. While working in the countryside, he practiced playing basketball and ultimately was recruited onto the Chinese national team. In China, I was a big star, travel everywhere in the world, and representing China, got all the benefits you know, and all that stuff. I was not happy. I was dying inside. My basketball was hijacked by a government, government of evil. I came here, I was happy. For the first time, I feel happy. Happiness, you know, and penniless, I came here. I worked, uh, you know, in a, in a fast food, you know, and, and meanwhile, attend adult school to learn English. Kai Chen went on to earn a political science degree from UCLA and is now a successful businessman who extols the benefits of America and its free enterprise system. It's funded for the free souls like me. Like we come here and we, we want to establish ourselves. We, don't, we create values. We are not zombies. We do not suck values from others. We create values. Now I live in this house, this beautiful house. I didn't steal, I didn't rob, I didn't do anything bad. I saw opportunity, I create value, I enjoy my life. That's what it is, that's what America is about. Once America is perverted, once America is gone, so goes the world. I mean, where am I gonna go? Where are the Kai Chen's in the world are gonna go? American people, you need to hear what I say. I'm here to tell you, do not change. You exist with a special meaning by God. In this program, we've witnessed firsthand the clear and present danger of socialism. Any system that tries to dethrone God and undermine the biblical truth about human nature is destined to fail. May our nation learn these lessons now before we go any further down the path toward the end of faith and freedom. As we look at the issue of socialism, ultimately it's a spiritual issue. It boils down to who do we trust in, God or the government? Recently in socialist Venezuela, 
Some of the leaders there are literally praying our Chavez who art in heaven in reference to the late dictator of that country, Hugo Chavez. There's great danger in making the government into a God. And in America, there's a concerted movement to erase God from the discussion altogether. Instead of God bless America, they want God less America. The excellent commentator Todd Starnes from Fox News has written a brand new book documenting this with exactly that title, God Less America, Real Stories from the Front Lines of the Attack on Traditional Values. And we want to send it to you for a limited time for your generous donation of any amount to the ongoing work of this ministry. Only God can turn us from the selfishness and envy that drives socialism, which is creeping into everyday American life. Please write to us at Box 6085, Albert Lee, Minnesota 56007, or call toll free 888-334-9762, or go online to truthinaction.org. This book is a powerful investigation of the secularist attack on America, and you'll want to get it right away. We've also put together a seven DVD series of messages from my father, the late D. James Kennedy, called, Does America Have a Prayer? At election time, this series contains the true answer for what our nation needs. There's reason for hope for America's future. Find it in this set. And we'll include it with Todd Starn's book, God Less America, for a generous donation of just $75 or more. Don't delay. Please write to us at Box 6085, Albert Lee, Minnesota 56007, or call toll free 888-334-9762, or go online to truthinaction.org. Todd Starn's compelling hardcover book, God Less America, is available for your generous donation of any amount. And the book plus the seven DVD or audio CD series, Does America Have a Prayer, are available together for your donation of $75 or more for a limited time. The ultimate antidote to socialism isn't just changes in our economic policy, although that's critical. Ultimately, it will require national repentance. We must turn away from greed and covetousness and turn back to God. So please also join us as we continue our 40 days of prayer for the election at truthinaction.org and make sure to vote on November 4th. Thank you for joining us and may God bless you as you stand with us. And may God bless America with a true revival. Today's program is available on DVD or audio CD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. Next week on Kennedy Classics. My friends, we live in an ocean of deception with vain words. Every kind of soft and subtle word is used to deceive the minds of people. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.